Amen. Grab your Bibles. Um, I just want to talk to you from my heart this morning. Um, we've been dealing with the story of Onesimus for the past um, two weeks. And so I'm on the back end of that. We finished that, but I want to clarify um, a movement or a point that was made in the middle of the message that um, the Lord won't just release me from. So before we shift gears and begin the next series I want to talk about, I just want to kind of share this with you. Um, if you have not listened to the story of Onesimus, make sure you at least get the app or go to iTunes and download the podcast. Um, it's worth listening to. Share some good perspective. Those of you that were here Wednesday, we had that difficult talk and conversation about some of the implications of that story. So I just want to encourage you to um, go there so that God can speak to you. Amen? Okay, um, let me pray and then I'm going to walk you through where we're going to go this morning. I have a couple of scriptures, but I'm going to be specifically in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Lord, we thank you for you. Open our hearts this morning as we share. I thank you for a beautiful congregation, a beautiful body of believers. So Holy Spirit, as we talk this morning, as we engage, as we interact, as we encounter Scripture, open our hearts to hear more of what you have in store for us, God. So speak clearly, bring to my mind everything that have been deposited. Um, if I miss anything, it's obviously you didn't want me to say it, but Lord, bring to remembrance what you want to hear, because uh, my heart is for this congregation this morning, so we can be about your business. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. So go to Romans chapter 8. We'll begin there and um, talk through that a little bit and allow God to be God to us this morning. Romans chapter 8. Now I'm going to um, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor quick and say, neighbor, you should be excited that God chose you. Yeah. Turn to your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, you should be excited this morning. That God chose you. Yeah, yeah. I want to wrestle with that. I want to wrestle with that just for, just for a little while. Um, don't know how far we'll get with it, but we'll see. We'll see what God says. Onesimus was chosen by God. And here's what the Lord dropped in my spirit. Um, even after, you know, you study, you pray, you spend time with God um, from Starbucks to here this morning, the Lord kind of dropped in my spirit this word. Where you are, let me, yeah, where we are individually in life right now is a direct result of our individual obedience to God and the providential intervention of God in our lives, okay? Um, I'm going to go this far and be crazy and bold enough to say this. If you are a child of God, the devil has nothing to do with where you are right now in life. Yeah, I'm going to be that crazy to say that, okay? And perfectly when we walk through Scripture, you'll see. So don't blame nothing you've gone through in life if you're a child of God on the devil. Not right now, okay? Notice what I said when I opened up. Where we are right now is a direct result of our obedience to God and the providential intervention of God in your life. If we chose not to obey God and stuff went crazy, don't blame the devil, own it. Because <laughs> we disobeyed, right? If we disobeyed and stuff go haywire, own it. So I want to kind of walk through that. Um, as we look at Onesimus a little bit, just by way of review, to kind of move real quickly to get us to where I want to share uh, this morning. Um, a fellow that found himself in Rome, in Paul's presence, um, he was a slave that was owned by Philemon. However he got there, he got there. Um, Paul did a work in his life in leading him to Christ as personal Lord and Savior and was now sending, a, had then sent him back to Philemon and was asking Philemon to receive him not as a slave but more than a slave. And then he adds this phrase at the end of that request, a beloved brother in Christ. Very, very important. And the statement I made out of that was one of the movements we had in the sermon. I kind of have it on here. I want to put it on the screen so you all could see that. Was um, the second movement in the message is that sometimes God will allow us to go through those difficult situations to transform us and then restore us. Okay, very, very important. Um, whatever happened to, um, to, to, to Onesimus that caused him to be where he was, 
something he did, something, whatever the situation was, um, whatever the sets of circumstances, he ended up where he ended up. When you look at verse 15 of the book of Philemon, don't go there. Let me kind of talk to it for the interest of time. Paul, in instructing Philemon to receive Onesimus back, said these words to him. Um, maybe God um, allowed this thing, or God um, par- caused him to be parted from us for a season and then have him to be restored. And what we saw in that is when we looked at the grammar that was nuanced in the verb parted, it was written in the passive voice. And what I kind of hinted at you for the past few weeks, when the subject is silent in the passive, um, most grammaticians will say or commentators will say that's a divine passive, meaning that God is responsible for the action of the verb. Okay? And so what that means, this is very, very important what I'm saying to you. What that means is that the majority of the commentators will say to you um, what Onesimus went through, uh, his encounter with Paul, his return home, his running away, all of that stuff was God working in his life to put him where he ends up at the end. Okay? I need you all to hear that. Because I want to put me in perspective. I want to put you in perspective. I want to bring balance to the transformative process that God wants to do in us so we can learn from it and start to move towards God. Right? Anybody tired of the cycle? Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Just, just tired of drama. Let's just get rid of it so we can get to where God would have us to go. So here, 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 here's the reason I'm, I want us to get that because I need you to hear me say this morning that God is sovereign. Okay, okay. Um, he is, come on, say God is sovereign. God is sovereign. I don't know if I have a slide that talks about that, but I kind of want, no, that's, I don't have one. Okay. I want to talk about the fact that God being sovereign because he, here's the, the simple version of God being sovereign is that God can do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, just cause he's God. Right? Just cause, yeah, just just cause he's God. Uh, I play chess, and one of the things that I love about chess is once I'm playing, I'm in charge. I can move my king, I can move my queen, I can do whatever I want to do on a chessboard, I'm in charge. The pieces can pray all they want. (laughs) The pieces don't influence my move. I decide the move based on how I want to win the game. You guys get what I'm saying? I think it's the same thing with us and God. Very, very important. He is the chess player. We are the pawns on the board. That's not a demeaning statement. I just want you to understand the sovereignty of God. Come on, say God is sovereign. Say it again. Say God is sovereign. The, 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 the most relevant and simple illustration that I can give you as we kind of talk through the text and go into the message It's tomorrow, the majority of the world, I think the Midwest United States is going to experience what's known as a solar eclipse. Is that what tomorrow, is that what's supposed to happen? Yeah, that that just brought to mind the sovereignty of God because it says to me, who else but God could create a sun, a moon, and an earth, right? And who else but God can cause the earth to rotate so fast that you don't fall off? Come on, y'all. Water from the other end don't fall down when the earl turns upside down. Y'all not hearing me. Come on. And yet you don't get dizzy in the rotation. Who else but God, right, can have the sun, come on, the the moon rotating about the sun, the earth rotating about all that stuff, and then just at the right time, just for kicks, because he can do it. In the middle of the day, he'll say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cause sun to shine on earth, and I'm going to take moon and bring moon around and have moon stop right in the middle of the sun shining its light on the earth, such that in the middle of the day, it's going to get dark. Come on, perplexing people. Who else? Come on. Man cannot do that. Scientists cannot do it. Y'all are not hearing me this morning. Who else but God can do stuff like that? Man, that, I just have to say that's sovereign. That's sovereign. Does that make sense? And, and not only, not only, not only does he direct the cosmic world, because if that's just an indication of what he could do in the cosmic realm, imagine what he can do in the earth realm. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. 
Last I checked, the sun is bigger than me. The moon is bigger than me. Come on now. The earth is bigger than me. And if he can do that for the cosmic realm, imagine what he can do in my life. Imagine what he can do in your life. Imagine what he can do because it speaks about the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is in control. And to me, when, I, when I'm making the statement that God will take us to a transformation process so he can restore us, everything that I go through in life, to me, I'm learning more and more God is in control. Come on, just repeat after me this morning. Just say, God is in control. Say it again. Say, God is in control. Very, very important. And I kind of, when I look at, at the passage that I want to read, we're going to read this morning, Romans chapter 8. I'm going to deal with verse 28 onward just to kind of lay a quick foundation. I want us to understand that, that God is guiding everything. And so when I read Romans 8, I see nothing but a clear picture of the providential intervention of God not only in my life, not only in our life, but in, in the entire earth realm where he's the, directing the affairs of everything that we go through. So I have a couple of things. I want, I want you all to get a clear understanding of what divine providence is. And I have a couple of definitions I want to walk through. Just a few statements I want to read so you can hear this, and then we're going to walk through the text. So divine providence is the care and supervision of God over his creation from the moment it is conceived to all of eternity. So the moment God said, let there be and there was, providence kicked in because he's in control. Until he says stop and it ends, he will maintain control. Does that make sense? Providence is God acting through his sovereign unlimited power and knowledge to fulfill his purpose for all creation including man. Remember my illustration with the chessboard, what that statement says, God is watching the pieces, and at the right time, he puts the pawn at the right place, and he puts the knight at the right place, and he puts the rook and the bishop. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because he's king. Okay? So that, that's what that talks about. At the right time, he does what he needs to do. Providence is God. Because he's the creator of all things, he upholds, he directs, he disposes, he governs all creation from the greatness to the least by his most wise, infallible knowledge. My, my definition of this is that God knew what to know before knowledge was invented for him to know what to know because he's God. <laughs> well, Y'all missed that. <laughs> Providence is God, God's activity in relation to what was previously created. I want, want us to get clear on providence. Divine providence means that God has his hands on all, in all life forms from the largest to the least of the microscopic world. So, so there's nothing, there is nothing, um, nothing that's, that, that's, that, that God that exists in the earth realm, the largest animal to the smallest one that he's not in control of. Does that make sense, guys? Okay? So providence is... Um, providence is the series of events. Listen to this last one because this is where I want to talk. It is the series of events in the life of an individual happening for a specific purpose and reason leading up to or preparing the individual for the next event that's about to transpire in their life. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to get that. If you don't, if, get, Put that up there just for a couple of seconds. If you don't hear nothing else I say, let this help you. Providence is the series of events in the life of an individual, listen to this, happening for a specific purpose or reason leading up to or preparing the individual for the next event or thing that's going to happen in your life, in their life. Nothing is accidental or incidental with God. Does that make sense? Let me give you a brief illustration of, of divine providence from Scripture um, when I was going through Onesimus, I talked to you about providence to some extent in the life of Joseph. Consider Moses for a little while. Divine providence would look like this in Moses' life, right? A Levite man, the Israelites are in bondage in Egypt. It's, it's nearing the end of 400 years. A Levite man marries a Levite woman. They give birth to a son. Now, at that time, Pharaoh was killing every child two years and under. Y'all know the story. Providence is... 
his mother trying to preserve the life of that son and placing him in the river. Does that make sense? Providence is Pharaoh's daughter coming down and taking a bath in the same river that Moses is hidden in. Divine providence is Moses' mom being smart enough to place Miriam, his sister, to oversee the baby so that when Pharaoh's daughter come, if anything happens, she can speak to what's happening. Divine providence looks like this. Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby. Miriam says, I know a babysitter. Y'all not hearing me. <laughs> Divine providence is Pharaoh's daughter allowing Miriam to, take, uh, to preserve the life of Moses and take him home to the very mother who birthed him so she can raise him to teach him who he is in God. Divine providence is such that when Moses gets of age, his own mother now takes him back to Pharaoh's daughter and says to her, here's the child I raised for you. Divine providence went like this. God allowed that to happen so Moses could be raised in Pharaoh's house so he could learn the dress, the language, the culture, the food of the Egyptians. Y'all not hearing me. Divine providence goes like this. When Moses began to grow up, he started to see an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and he killed the Egyptian, his worst nightmare. Divine providence went like this. It caused Moses to flee from Egypt to go to the wilderness to encounter a man by the name of Jethro. Divine providence says the reason he met Jethro so he can get a wife by the name of Zipporah and he can find out who God really is. Y'all not hearing me. Divine providence says that God allowed him to be in that wilderness for those 40 years to have encounters, to have a relationship with God, so that one day, while he's out in the wilderness, he would see a bush on fire, but the bush was not consumed. Y'all not hearing me this morning. Divine providence says that God would speak to him in the midst of that burning bush and tell him the reason I allowed you to go through all of those series of events so that now I have transformed you, I want to restore you and send you back to the very place that I brought you out of so you can tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Are you hearing me? Divine providence. Now, now. Left in isolation, each one of those events could seem catastrophic in and of themselves. If you were in Egypt at the time when all the wanted posters were hung up, wanted, let me add this, dead or alive, Moses the Hebrew for what he did, it looked terrible at the moment. It looked difficult at the moment. It looked like there was no hope from that at the moment. And the problem with me and the problem with you, because we don't understand the providential intervention of God, we take our life in isolation and we look at each thing and it seemed catastrophic because at the moment we don't put the story of God for our lives together and it looks bad. Come on, I'm not, I know I'm not talking to myself this morning. But if we can put it all together, that happened for this. That happened for that. That happened for this. That happened for that. And where I am and what I'm going through right now is preparation for the next thing that's going to happen. It looks like a beautifully woven thread that says this. All things work together. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the good of them who what? Love God. And those who are what? Called according to his purpose. Now, I am not seeing that the pain of the moment is not real. What I want you to hear me say, the pain of the moment is still the providential intervention of God. And here is where we miss God. When we look external as opposed to looking internal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're so good, we're so great, we're so sinless, we're so, come on, y'all, we're so whatever that we could not possibly have done anything wrong. It had to be them who did it to us. <laughs> Let me go back to the second movement of the message. The divine passive says, sometimes God will take you through stuff. <laughs> I think y'all got it. I think you got it. I think you got it. Let's read Romans 8, and then um, I'm going to move quick because I just, want, I just want to help 
I want to help us to get to where God would have us to go this morning. Amen. Romans chapter 8, if you're there, say amen. amen. Now, please hear me say this morning, I'm speaking to people who love God. Um, I'm speaking to people who are called by God. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to be crazy enough to say, and, and to say this. You don't have to be saved for this apply to you. The only prerequisite is that you love God. And I'm comfortable in saying by virtue of the fact that you're here this morning, you're not an atheist. Because atheists are where atheists are. People who love God got up and got dressed and came to church. Amen? So let me, for context, back up to verse 26. And I'm going to try to do this all in about 10 minutes or so and see what God is saying. Okay? Verse 26 says, just jumping in the middle of a passage just here, it says, likewise, the Spirit, capital has I mean, the ESV, helps us in our weakness. And I like what it says here, for we do not know what to pray for or um, pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. You get that? So, so we think we know. So here's what we say. Pray for me for this, okay? Or my wife is acting up. That's how we put the prayer request up there. Lord, pray for my family because my wife is acting up. And here's what the Spirit does. He intercepts that prayer, and he goes to the Father and says, Father, it really ain't the wife, it's the husband. Because it says we don't know what we ought to pray for. Are oh, y'all not hearing me? Come on. Come on. Are you with me? Because providence is not about the wife. It's about you who's offering up the prayer, right? Or the other way around. We pray for ourselves. Come on. Are you guys attracted with me? And then it says here, verse 7, and he who searches hearts, you get that? He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the, in, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to who? The will of what? Yeah, yeah. So let me stick with my chess illustration. So watch this. The rook is on the board and the rook is praying up to the player. Hey man, if you move me over here, I'll do this. And here's what the prayer gets intercepted and the, the, the player says, I know what I want. Quit trying to tell me what you want to do. Y'all going to get this in a little while. Okay. It's, it's based on God's will, not my desires. Are you with me? Because if you'd have asked Moses, he would not have gone through the things that he went through. But it wasn't about Moses, it was about God's will for Moses, and more importantly, God's will for delivering the Israelites from Egypt. Now, the reason I want you to hear me say that is because like Onesimus and like Moses, I'm chosen, you're chosen, we're all chosen to do what God wants done, so God is directing our paths. Okay? Let me keep going here. Verse, and, and it says here, verse 28, and we know that those who... Love God. This is my translation. All things work. And then there's an interesting Greek word, sunergeho, which means together for good. Okay? Say, all things work together. One more time. Say, work together. So, so here's what that means. The best and fastest way I can give you a literal meaning of sunergeho is like, it's like you have a person on a board in a boat, and they're in the middle of a lake, and the boat has two oars. Okay? Now, if you chose, choose to use one oar to row your boat, and you're doing like this, here's what you're going to do. And this is what some of our lives look like. Come on. <laughs> Called a cycle of iniquity. Because we're using one oar. And Sunergejo says, you got one, God's got the other. So you need to do, yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying? And so he says, God takes your life, and he takes his will, and he roars them both together. Okay? They work together for those who love God, um, those who are called according to his purpose. Now, notice what 29 says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, don't get caught up on theological terms, predestination, that the message is not about that. I just want us to see ourselves being transformed for restoration. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he, um, whom he predestined, he called. Um, let me go here. 
And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he did what? Okay, repeat out to me these words. Say foreknew. Say predestined. Say called. Say justified. Say glorified. Okay, let me, let me walk you through this as, as fast as I can, um, just to kind of give you a feeling. We don't have time to go through all the scriptures, so I'll quote some if I can remember how they go. Here's what you just saw in that text. God foreknew you, okay? So this is a very, very important statement. Jeremiah 1 says, uh, 1, 4, and 5, I think it says it this way, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Okay, that Hebrew word no has some deep sexual nuances associated with it, meaning that God was intimate with us before mom and daddy came together to conceive. Wow. Now, here's the importance of that statement. I want you all to hear me. Here's the importance of that statement. Before, what's, what comes, was it the sperm and the egg? Yeah, acting like y'all don't know, y'all know. Yeah. Before those two things came together and the egg got fertilized, okay, um, God knew you. He knew you. He knew you. He, come on, say he knew me. Now, here's what that meant. He allowed that particular sperm to connect with that particular egg to fulfill his unique purpose in the earth realm. Y'all know how this goes, right? Out of the million of sperm that's released, there's only one that... Y'all know how this works. Come on. Are you with me? He, he allowed it to happen for that purpose. Now, here's what he says. When that thing happened, here's what you need to hear me say. God says, it is time for this to happen in the earth realm, so I'm going to create this person. Don't think it was an accident that 400 years after slavery, a Hebrew man connects with a Levite woman and gives birth to a son. It was just time. Your presence on the earth realm is indicative of God's time for your life. So he foreknew. So here's the importance of him foreknowing us, right? Now that we're on the scene, don't fool yourself into thinking you know better than God. Don't make that mistake, okay? Because you didn't foreknow yourself, so you don't know what your ultimate plan is. God does. Does that make sense? And so here's the next word. He foreknew us, and so he predestined us uh, to be conformed, um, predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, if you got a quick second, go to Ephesians. I just want to read that one. That's a really juicy one. Um, let me see if I can get to Ephesians real quick. If, if you can't find it fast enough, if you find yourself in the Old Testament, let me read it for you. Okay. <laughs> Here's what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blesses us in, um, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What I like about that is that here's what I said a couple of minutes ago. God chose you. God chose you, okay? Here's how I just want to summarize this issue of him predestining us. He chose you to look like Jesus. Oh. You guys all right with me? So he predestined us. Let me go through here. We're almost there. And then I like this. So because he has purpose, before you came on the scene, he foreknew. He predestined, said, I want them to do this. He allows you to come into the earth realm. Now, here's the thing. This is, remember my opening statement, where we are today is a direct reflection of our obedience to God. Remember me saying that? So here's what I want you all to hear me say, then we're going to walk through this real quick. So once you're here, he begins the calling process. When you get of age, however you want to say it, feel it! Felix! But by then, Felix is, you know, knucklehead, 14, 15, young boy. My boys are more important than God. So I hear my boys, I don't hear God. I'm a young an adolescent, so I like sin. I like the things of the world. So I see the things of the world, and I hear those things. I don't hear God. The whole time, he is still, feel it! Right? 
And so he is calling, he's calling, he's calling. The problem is not him calling, it's me. Yeah, you kind of get it. Does this make sense? Let me give you a quick one. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Um, let me give you a quick one real quick. Um, Revela- no, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Yeah, we'll make this. Revelation chapter 3. You guys are there? And look at verse 14. I'm just going to read 14 for context, and I'm going to jump down to verse 20. Okay. You there? So now watch this. He says, to the angel of the church at Laodicea, I write, the faithful and the amen. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold, so be, um, because you're right now you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold. So he says, I'll spit you out of your mouth. Okay? Jump down to verse 20. I need it to do that for context. If you're at 20, say amen. amen. So watch this. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in. And if you have a King James, it says, sup with him. Mine says, eat with him and him with me. Okay? So here's, here's what I like about this verse, because here's what that verse says to me. Felix! That's him knocking. Right? And he's knocking. And I'm choosing not to listen because I like what I'm doing. So sometimes, you yeah, remember Balaam and Balak? And, and he was um, trying to send Balaam to do something, and he wouldn't hear. And then he put a donkey in the road to talk to him. Did I get, is that the right story? Am I getting right? Y'all yeah, remember that? Right? Is that, okay. Remember that? And so what happens with me is sometimes God will put a donkey in the road. Y'all just missing this? So what will happen, I'll be riding my bike, this is a true story, and I'll fall and I'll break my hand. And that's him really trying to get my attention. Felix! So he's knocking. I don't get that. Okay, you missed that one. Then some other catastrophic thing will happen in my life. Maybe a job and I'll get fired from the job, right? And here's what I'm going to say. He's like, Felix, trying to get your attention. I'm blaming the people on the work the whole time he's talking. Can I get what I'm saying? I get in a marriage and then the marriage will be haywire the whole time. He's like, Felix, and I'm, I'm so dumb I'm acting like Adam. It's the woman you gave me. If you hadn't given me that woman, my life would be fine. And he's like, I'm using her to talk to you. Felix! But I'm not hearing. Are you with me? Come on now. And he's, he's knocking the whole time. He's knocking. So then all of a sudden, you know, you go through stuff. Your marriage might fall apart. You file bankruptcy. You lose your home. Whatever the situation. And we're, because we're so deaf to the voice of God, because we're not used to hearing it as holy as we are, we miss him calling every single time. So guess what he does? Sometimes he'll give you cancer and knock you on your back so you can't move. And while you're in the coma, he'll say, okay, now you're going to hear me. Felix! Because I find it interesting that a lot of us heard his voice in the midst of our worst nightmare because isn't it interesting when the storm comes is when we want to start praying to God, Lord, where are you? And he's hollering, Felix, I've been calling you the whole time, but you have not heard my knocking. Is this making sense? And the reason I'm knocking is because before you came on the earth, I knew you. So here's how he knocked on Moses' door. He allowed an Egyptian to die so he can get Moses' attention. Great sacrifice so he can get us. This is free. Who does God have to kill or allow to die so you and I can start listening? Right? You guys are tracking with me. I'm not going to make this. I was trying not to make this a two-part series. Let me keep going here. <laughs> and then, and then he, once we respond, once you respond, okay, the problem with you and the problem with me is we want God to use us and we haven't responded yet. Oh. Because here's what I want to say to you. The moment you respond, there is no way you can hear the voice of God, encounter God, and stay the same way you are and go with God. A transformation must take place. So here's what Paul said about Onesimus. He used to be useless. But now that he's heard, Onesimus! And he found himself where he was. And 
God did a work in him through Paul. Philemon, I can say to you, he who once was useless is now useful. Listen to me carefully. If you think God ought to be using you, but he's not yet using you, maybe you're still useless. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to say that. That slipped out. Get to useful stage. Right? And here's how I open the message. Where I am is a direct reflection of my obedience to God and the providential intervention of God in my life. So the more I disobey, the less he uses me. Right? So here's what Paul said to Philemon about Onesimus. He used to be useless. Now he's turned things around. And he's what? Useful, okay? Then at the end of life, we go to the glorification stage. Does this make sense, guys? God is in control. God is in control. Now, let me just re go back to Romans. Go back to Romans. Uh, let me share this in Romans. And then we'll talk through some things. Romans 8. And then we'll be done. Because this will speak for itself. Romans chapter 8. And look at verse 31. And 31 to the end. And we'll wrap this up. You guys are there? Amen. So based on everything I just said, here's what Paul, Paul said. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be what? And look at what it says. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us how many things? Now look at what it says in verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God elect? Is it, it is God who justifies who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, and he is doing what? Interceding for what? It, and I look at this, verse 33, verse 30, what is that, 5? Then look at this, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It says that it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long and we are regarded as sleep in a slaughter. slaughter. Verse 37, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors. Ah, oh, Jesus. Oh. Somebody say, I'm more than a conqueror. Come on, say it again. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, or I am sure, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, now here's how I said this when I opened the message, and y'all look at me crazy. The devil has no control over my life. If Romans 8, 31 through 39 is true, and God has me, and God is directing my path by way of divine um, um, providence, it really comes down to how obedient I am to Christ. Now, hear me say this. I am not saying that the devil will not tempt you. He will tempt you. Tempting and causing you to do are two different things. We do when we disobey and we, re we respond to the temptation. So I still need to take ownership for that. I can't say, man, the devil got to stop tempting me. Well, guess what? That's the equivalent to saying to him, you need to stop being the devil. Because he does what he does. If I understand the providential intervention of God and God directing my path, the more I get a light of that, when I am tempted, the more focused I'll be. So here's what it looked like in the life of Christ, right? He came to him right after his baptism and 40 days fast and says to him, if you're the son of God, do this, right? If you're the son of God, make this stone into the bread, jump off the mountain, all that stuff. And here's what Jesus said to him. It is written. He stayed focused on the word of God because he understood what God was doing in his life. And he knew that in all things, God was going to work together for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. So I need you to hear me say this morning as I wrap this up. You are chosen by God. You are elected by God. The things we go through in life is God transforming us, God molding us, God shaping us, God doing what he needs to do in us so he can restore us and use us for his purpose because the world is dying and going to hell and he's calling the church to be Christ in in the world to bring the world to a relationship with him. So this is what it looks like. You and I are delaying the return of God because we're too busy focusing on our own stuff. 
as opposed to being who God would have us to be. I mean, this is what we just read. We should not walk around with our head down, feeling discouraged, knowing that God has gave his all for us. He has great things. Uh, come on, y'all, in store for us. That's good news, right? Here's what this other one says. No one has a heaven or hell to put us in, <laughs> nor can they charge or condemn us. I mean, that's including the devil, right? Who can bring any charge against God's elect if we stay focused? Verse 4 is paramount. Christ is praying for you daily. Come on, y'all. As difficult and as hard-headed as we are, he is praying for us on a regular basis. Come on, worship team. Here's the last thing. This is very, very important. Nothing can change God's plan for us. This is a good one. I like that. My worst sin will not cause God to change his mind. Your worst sin will not cause God to change his mind. Are you hearing me say that? Okay. We, because here's what it says in 1 John, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive and then to do what? Cleanse from all unrighteousness. So it doesn't matter how much I blow it, I cannot cause God to change his mind for me. I just need to adjust and allow God to work through me. Does that make sense? Okay? And then look at the last one. And here's the good news is that we are more than conquerors. Because here's the good thing. We have already won. Okay? Onesimus' problem was this. While he was doing what he was doing, or while he was on the run, while he was going through what he's going through, he couldn't see the victory that was already in place for him. My problem is, is when I'm going through the thing, I can't see how the end is going to be, so I risk wallowing in the stuff. The good news I want you to hear me say today is that you've already won. We are more than conquerors. Victory belongs to us. We just need to go through, and God gets the glory on the end. So he takes us to this crazy transformation so he can put us back into where he's been. So this is why I've been saying for the past two weeks, when God restores, we ought to learn how to treat each other as equals in the body of Christ. Don't see me as the drug dealer I used to be. That was my past. My future is brighter than where I came from. Come on. Don't see me as the thief I used to be. Come on, y'all not hearing me this morning. That was my past. Y'all not hearing me. My future is brighter than where I came from. Don't see me as the adulterer that I used to be. That, maybe I'm only talking to myself this morning. That was my past. My future is brighter than where God has taken me. Come on. Don't see me as the liar or the manipulator or the bad business person I used to be. That was my past future is brighter than where God is going to take me. And I need you to hear me say to you this morning, your future is brighter than where you came from. The transformative process is for us to get to those places that God created us to be because he saw you before you sinned. Oh, y'all not to hear me. He saw you before you failed and he has greatness in store. Don't let your yesterday impede your tomorrow. We all blow it. We all sin. We all fail. We're sinners. That's going to happen. But Calvary is all about reclamation and restoration. Oh, I wish I had two folk this morning that will say amen with me. And so Romans 8 and 28 says it this way. In all things, come on, stand to your feet. God works for the good of those who what? Love him. Those who what? Are the called According to what? His purpose. Bow your heads with me as you pray. Thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for second chances. Thank you for third chances. Thank you for 40th chances. When Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? You're the one that said to him, 70 times, seven times, meaning you, there's no giving up. Thank you for not giving up on me. You transformed me. You're transforming us. You're taking us through what we've gone through so you can restore us, God. 
So thank you for restoration. It all works for the good. You can take our mess and you can make a message out of it. And for that, we glorify you. You be God in our midst, Lord. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.